Hi there! In this episode of Honeybee Mastery, I will deep dive into the possible implementation of the parts from a business layer in your project and show you why typed structs can be useful in your system. To do this, I will use DryStruct as a struct initialization engine. DryStruct is a project created by Nikita Shilnikov and managed by DryRB team, and I want to show you why it's extremely helpful giving you struct-like objects but on steroids. Unlike regular structs, those give you a static type checking for free and will raise an error each time you try to initialize a struct with invalid attributes violating the schema definition. One might think, awesome, a nice, easy to use validation gem for my project. But in the next moment, your eyes will see that within the dry family only, there are two other validation gems available already. Those are dry schema and dry validation, both great and together fulfill all needs of anyone who needs to validate anything. But more importantly, on the official website, you can find a section addressing directly the question of validating data by using DryStruct. It basically says that validating data with DryStruct is totally possible, but you are asked not to do it as it's designed to work with already valid data. What? You may now be wondering in which scenario you might need a type check if the data is supposed to be valid. I can feel your confusion, so let me show you a few examples of actual applications when DryStruct is useful. Event sourced systems. The first example I came up with is when you want to get benefits from the event sourcing in your applications. In such systems, one of the most important rules you would like to follow is that what happened, happened. It means when you publish an event, you should not remove it from the log or even update its data or structure. Most of the event stores don't even allow such a thing to happen by not implementing an interface for updating published events. Therefore, it's extremely important to be sure that every event in your system has a valid structure and all data they carry on are of a proper type. This is one example of when DryStruct can be useful. No matter if there can be a bug in the validation logic of the API interface or at any point of the processing, by using DryStruct, it is not possible to even instantiate an event with inappropriate data. Let me show it to you by an example. First, I will add a pre-setup script where I require DryStruct, then create my local types module in case I would want to extend it later and create the base event, including my types module in it. Then I'm going to define my business event. Let's say I want to track an event in the system where money is sent to the user. I can then add an attribute named sender ID and set a rule that it needs to be UUID type of value. I will repeat the same for receiver ID. This way, if I have UIDs in my project to define resources, there is no way to have an invalid format of the identifier when the event is published. Finally, for currency, I will just set a type of string and the amount will be set to big decimal. This one is pretty important as floats are not exact. So if we would allow floats to be passed into our system, we could end up with inconsistencies in total calculations. Now to test it out, let me add the IRB and the secure random libraries and run the script. This allows me to initialize correct events in the system that can be published to or read from the event log, but never allow inconsistent data to pass through. I never expose the interface for publishing events directly. Publishing an event is a result of the request call handled by my action or even the service object. So the parameters, which are my input, had already been validated and the request had been authorized before. 
At the point where an event is initialized, there should not be any validation issue whatsoever. And if there is a problem, it certainly is unexpected. So the error reason is completely accurate behavior. This way I can model my business logic without worrying about validation errors and just test each part of the system in encapsulation, being sure that it's not possible to publish anything that violates the application state. The second example touches commands or service objects. Even if you don't want to make use of events in your system, it's possible you will be interested in using the CQRS pattern in your application, or even just extract your business domain layer aside from the framework part and communicate with it via service objects. The rule is similar. A command or a service directly affecting your business domain state is something that can be called from multiple places. For example, API endpoints, rake tasks, background jobs, process managers, or in RISE, callbacks. All of those cases already have input data pre-validated as I have shown in episode 7. So again, it's completely fine to raise an error in case of calling a business command with an invalid set of attributes. Below, I will add a simple command and name it subscribe to Hanami Mastery. Then inside, I will set the command schema. As in the previous example, it will inherit from Drystruct and include my types module. Then I set up the subscriber ID, type of UUID and the email. With this, I'm going to define the interface to call my command. The call method accepts the input argument and initializes my command schema as the first step. In case of invalid input, we raise the error as the input should be validated before in the controller action. If the error is not raised, then we are 100% sure that we work with valid data types, which minimizes the possibility to call subscription clients with incorrect data. When I call this, the command will return a successful value in case of correct data, but raise the descriptive error otherwise. The third example is about value objects. It's one of the most useful cases for using Drystruct, in my opinion. I can't count how many times I have seen undefined method errors on new class in Ruby. And having the type check verification on arguments passed into the value object practically eliminates such errors. It raises an error during the value object initialization, but with a way more detailed error message which helps a lot in debugging and testing your application. Here is an example of simple gender value object where you can initialize the object using integer and in case of passing an invalid value, you get an error similar to integer invalid. By setting the type and restricting the minimal and maximum value, I can eliminate the possibility to set gender value yet unsupported by the system, while keeping this thing easily extendable in the future. For now, let's just add 2i and 2s methods. You can see that setting the type validation check on the value attribute simplifies a lot the whole class. I don't need to care about casting values and I don't need to consider the case where value is out of supported range. Again, I can instantiate the gender with the correct value, but in case of error, it will return the descriptive error message. The value objects allow us to eliminate from our system the primitive obsession code smell and keep our systems way more reliable. This is just basic example, but I believe you get the idea. Typed structs and deeply frozen structs are very useful tool and I certainly barely scratch the surface of possible applications to make use of them. I would love to see in what scenarios do you apply them in your project, so feel free to send me some code samples or article references in the comments of these episodes. And if you do want to see more advanced content, join the Hanami Master Premium, where I dig much deeper into these topics. I hope you have enjoyed this episode. 
And if you want to see more content in this fashion, subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Twitter. I would like to especially thank my existing GitHub sponsors and a new sponsor, Andrzej Krzywda, for supporting this project and the whole Hanami Master Initiative. I appreciate that as without your financial support, this project could not exist. Thanks to all of you for being a part of the great Ruby community and for all the positive reactions you give me every day. You are awesome. Feel free to check out my other episodes and if you have any suggestions of amazing Ruby gems you would like me to cover or ideas on how to improve, please mention them in the comments. Have a nice day and see you in the next Hanami Master episode.